Okay, hi again, everybody. Um, so one quick caveat. Um, if you have not watched the video that is um, uh, in videos for week four, it's the YouTube video and it shows a teacher reading with a student and you get to see um, both the teacher as she's uh, doing the reading record as well as what the child is, is reading. Watch that first before you watch this because <laughs> that's going to be your baby step. Um, this part. So just make sure that you have a uh, you've watched that one first in the videos for week four, the YouTube before you watch this one. Because what we're going to do in this one is you're going to give um, reading records a try. And again, if you've done reading records before, running records before, you know, great. It's always good practice to to listen to a kiddo um, and and compare how you would interpret a child's moves with another teacher. Um, but if you haven't done it before, give yourself plenty of space and grace because this is going to be your very first one. And, um, and the first one's always a little scary. Um, so you can do this one of three ways. So the first way is you could pause this recording and print out this teacher copy assessment, um, which is in your files for week four. It's from Teachers College for Reading and Writing, Lucy, Ca Lucy Calkins' baby. Um, so you can print this out so that you have a hard copy and you can actually annotate on it as the teacher in the YouTube video did in our videos for week four folder. Or um, how I did it is I actually have a tablet, so I just got out my stylus and started um, using that to annotate. So you could um, do that if you have a device where you can digitally annotate, you could do that too. Or choice three, if you're feeling froggy, you can go into your files for week four and I've put um, a bunch of different examples of blank running records where they won't have the text like this, but you could still mark um, check marks as you go, um, and uh, as as I as the child make miscues, you can record them that way. Totally your choice. So decide now how you want to do that. Go ahead and pause this recording so you can choose one of those ways. And um, then I am going to read to you as a child. So a couple of things to note: this is a level J text, as you can see up near the top. Um, we stop after the first 100 words, which this one from Teachers College, it's really nice. They, they show you where that cutoff is. Not every reading record does that, so you have to count and know where 100 words stops. The reason why we stop at 100 words is one for time. I don't need to listen to a child read for, you know, any more than maybe five minutes to get an idea of what their reading process is and how they're doing with this level of text. And two, stopping at 100 words helps me calculate accuracy really easily. If I stop at 100 words and you've made four errors, then that means you're at 96% accuracy. Um, but remember, accuracy is just the very top layer of looking at a child's reading when we're, when we're analyzing for uh, miscues. So that being said, I'm going to go ahead and from, um, you can see that the book introduction, I'm, as the teacher, the teacher is going to say the title of this book is Punched Paper. This story is about children who make something called punched paper for their classroom. Let's see to find out why and how they make punched paper. So you're providing the child with some context for the story um, and, and letting them know, you know, we're going to be reading together. So from this point on, I'm going to read as if I am um, the student. Okay, here we go. Our class is going to have a party. We all ch uh, ch uh, uh, chose jobs to do. Mm, I don't know that name. So I tell her Maria. Maria and I chose to make deck, decor, decor. And so the teacher tells her, decorations. Decorations. We peek in the subly. Subly closet. We find scissors, tape, yarn, glue, paper napkins, call. Color red, color red paper and crayons. Maria, what can we make? I ask. I know 
And Andy, how about punched paper? Maria says we can use these napkins. Maria chose a red napkin. She opens it up and cuts half a flower shape on the fold, fold, folded edge. I don't want to make a flower, I tell Maria. Okay, she said. This is how you make a fish. Next, we fold, fold our napkins back up. All right, so if you needed to, the nice thing about me recording this is you could pause, you can go back and listen to me read it again if I was reading too soon quickly for you um, and see if you can complete the reading record um, on that. So I'm going to show you my version of what I did for this one. Okay, so the first thing I want to mention is that I don't always use check marks. I know that a lot of reading teachers do, but sometimes I just feel like it's just too much on the paper. So I used them this time because it's the traditional way of doing it. However, typically when I'm in the, the moment, I'm just listening. And if they make a miscue or if they show me something reading wise, I mark it. But otherwise, I just leave it. It just seems like a lot. Um, but you can see on the first line, she made no mistakes. And I put a little line for party. Like I could see her getting that word part, party. Um, on the second line, she got to the word shoes. And she said chose after a little bit of a struggle with it. So I count that as an error. And right now we're not going to look at this MSV part. We're just looking at errors. Um, anytime that a child asks for a proper noun, the first time that the child asks for it, you give it to them and it is not considered an error. After that, though, it's considered an error each time if you have to continue to tell them um, the proper name. So she appealed. I was like, I don't know that name. And I gave it to her. But I did not... Um, I did not count that as an error. She did say chose again, and then she really struggled with decorations. You know, she got the deck, she could see the or, she tried, and I ended up giving her that one as well, decorations. Now this one, because this is not a proper name, this counts as an error. So you can see there's two total errors in line three. Maria does not count as one because it's the first time asking for the proper name. Chose counts as one. And the decorations counts as one because it's, again, a teacher telling, but not a proper name. So two errors for that one. Um, for the next line, the first line on page three, she said supply instead of supply. So that counts as an error. Um, no errors on line four, or sorry, that's one, two, three, four, five. No errors on line five. An error on line six, when she got to the word colored, she said color red. So that counts as one error. Even though she said color red, and that's two words, she was just saying it for that one word. So that counts as one error there. Then no errors. She's, I noticed that she saw and in Andy. So I just make that notation for me because I'm thinking, okay, she's seen word chunks. She's seen parts of words. And that just kind of helps me know more about her as a reader. Um, again, no, no uh, miscues until she gets to the word chooses again. And again, she says chose. And some people say, well, she said chose one, two, you know, three times. Does it count as an error every time? Yes, it does. It counts as an error each time. So there's one there. Um, and then uh, I saw she, she had old in the word folded. So I noted that she chunked that word, um, you know, found the parts in that word and was still getting it right. Um, and it, no errors until right here, she said said instead of says. So that counts as an error. And that was the last error she made. So if we're just looking at errors, she made one, two, three, four, five, six, seven errors out of 100 words, which gives her an accuracy rate of 93%. As this being an independent level book, remember independent level, we have 98% or higher. It is not. This is not an independent level book for her. We're going to talk more about um, percentages and thinking about um, independent level and instructional level and frustrational level in, in another week. But you know that 93%, nope, 
not an independent level for her. Okay, so that's just the errors. That's the E column. The SC is for self-correction. So if that's when a child makes an error and then they self-correct. Um, if a child self-corrects, that error does not count against them. So if she had said, we all chose, I mean choose, jobs to do, that would not count as an error because she fixed it. But it would count as a self-correction. And that's an important thing to notice because what does that mean? That means that in her brain, she has all these cueing systems and they're starting to integrate. She's starting to notice. She's starting to think, oh, well, that looks like it could be chose. Oh, but it's choose. So it does not count as an error when they self-correct. But what do we notice about this child as a reader with self-corrections? Not a single one. And for me as a literacy teacher, that is a huge red flag. No matter if a child is five or 15, I need to see some self-correcting when they make a mistake. Not a little mistake, like if they say A for the, I mean, great if you're gonna self-correct that. But when I don't see a self-correction for something like supply closet, that's not good. So I always count down here, no self-correction. There was no self-corrections at all. Um, Another thing I notice as a child, one of the first things I teach kiddos to do when they get to a point of uh, problem is to reread. And so it's interesting, you know, depending on the teachers I'm working with or the kiddos I'm working with, I, if the kiddo, if the first thing they do when they reach a point of problem is start to sound it out, then I know that child is a print dependent reader. Think about our video from before this one. That child is a looking at that visual first. But what are we really trying to make? We're trying to make kiddos that know that reading makes sense. And one of the first things we do, you and me, as adult readers, if we get to a word we're not sure about, we reread almost automatically. We go back and we go, oh, I must have missed something. When we're teaching kids to read, very rarely do we have that be the first strategy they go to, but it should be. Because sometimes all it takes is a quick reread. I get the rest. I get the first part of that sentence getting me going and then I get to my point of problem and it might help me you know, over that hump of realizing, oh, I know what that word is, or oh, in the context of the rest of the sentence, I know what it is. There was no rereading for meaning. When she got stuck, she had one way of figuring out a word. And let's look at our MS and V to see what that might be. So for MS and V, you have MS and V for error and MS and V for self-correction. For the error, it's again, meaning, structure, and visual. So bringing up, I'm going to bring up the Sumita chart real quick, which is in your files this week. Again, remember, meaning is thinking about, like, does this make sense? The context of the sentence. Um, the V is, like, visual, phonics kinds of things, letters, word parts. The structure is just, does it sound right in the English language? Okay? So let's go back to what we were looking at. In the errors, we want to look to see, what is she using when she makes that mistake? So this is an important piece of MISQ analysis. This is a huge piece of reading records and running records. We are looking to see not necessarily what the child isn't using. We want to see what the child is using. Because if we know what the child is using, then we know where that gap is of what we need to go to next. So let's look at the word choose. The first time she encountered choose, she went ch o o s ch o o s chose chose. So even though we all chose jobs to do, it does make sense. I, I went ahead and checked that. It does make sense. We all chose jobs to do make sense. Structurally, it sounds fine in the English language. She didn't say we all chose jobs to do. It makes sense in the structure of the English language. But then visually, she used everything except for the middle, that middle piece. But if so if we're looking at this, we may think, oh, she's got an integrated system. Look what she did. She used meaning and structure and visual. But when we're listening to that child read, she wasn't like, oh, we all chose jobs to do. She didn't just kind of miss that middle. What did she do first? She sounded out first. So right now we know visually with that miscue, with that error, right there, right now she's a pretty heavily visual reader. It tended to make sense and sound structurally right. And, you know, it happened again down here. But let's look at supply. 